Learn the difference between commitment and ownership. Have you all ever been in a rubber raft? Anybody here? With a bunch of, a bunch of people in there with you? So they're not easy to steer. And so we had this mission in Panama. It was a training mission. And there was, a, there was a bunch of enemies sitting on objective up off on top of a hill. And it was off the coast of Panama. So the, the, the battalion had this idea because the Chagres River was dividing where the battalion was from where the enemy was. So they had this concept that my scouts, we were the recon platoon, we would be sent on a landing craft uh, off the coast of Panama. We would be dumped into the ocean on a rubber boat and we would work our way in on the rubber boats to the beach where nobody would expect infantry soldiers to show up. We would, nav we would maneuver our way in, recon the positions, and get the information back to our battalion. Sounds like a great plan on paper, as most plans do. So I'm in the landing craft, it's the middle of the night, and the landing craft does what a landing craft does because they really don't care about space and time, they got a motor, and so they drop the ramp, they say this is where we're supposed to be, I can't see a thing from outside of there, it's like the belly of the whale out there. They drop us off, we pull our boats out, we get out, we get in the boats, the landing craft pulls back and for the first time I can see where we're at. And I realize we are in a lot of trouble. We are way too far off the coast, we have no motor, all I've got is 12, 12, 12 15 guys in a boat. Um, and all we have is our oars, and we are way off the coast, so far away that I'm worried we might not get back. And two problems that we're facing. A, the current is pulling us hard to the left, and we're already left of the objectives, and I have to fight against the current to get there. If I go with the current and try to push through this way, it's gonna plop us right into the mouth of the Chagres River. Well, the mouth of the Chagres River is the mating, season, mating ground of the hammerhead sharks. That's where Jacques Cousteau's son got eaten. So I know if we go there, we're piggies in a blanket. I can't land there. But the other side of the current is pushing us left and it's pushing us back, which means we're going out to the open ocean, which isn't going to go well either because I have no communications. So everybody's doing everything like normal, right? I got my little 19, 25, 30 year old soldiers in the boat. They're all paddling. It's a normal day for them, sort of, except they're in the middle of the ocean on a rubber raft. And everything is going according, in their mind, according to plan, but I realize we're not going to make it unless something changes. So I say, everybody look at me. There is our objective to our right. That's where we're supposed to be going. The current is taking us there to my left. That's the mouth of the Chagres River. You know what happens if we go there. I said, look behind me. That's the open ocean. That's the other place the current is taking us. So you have two options. We row or we die. And guess what they did? <laughs> Six or seven hours later, we finally fight through and we land. And I tell that story for two reasons. A, understand that they changed and something changed in that boat that night. First of all, they moved from commitment to ownership. Understand that commitment got these soldiers into the army. Commitment got them to Panama. Commitment got them into the scout platoon, it got them into the landing craft, and commitment got them into that boat. But it was ownership that got them through and onto the beach, or they never would have made it. At some point, it stopped being my mission, it stopped being the battalion's mission, it stopped being somebody else's mission, and it became our mission. At that point, we had turned a corner. And the responsibility for the results of the mission were no longer somebody else's, but it all fell on each and every one of us. That's when you change the corner to excellence. When you go from commitment to ownership. Commitment gets you into the game. Ownership is what takes you over the edge and into the excellent side of the game. A funny thing is, too, something else that I like to use that story for is that what most people fail to realize is that when it comes to ownership, um, I'm the leader in that boat. So I'm in the back, I'm giving commands, I'm giving, I have somebody doing stroke, 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 I'm telling them what to do. And I'm technically the official leader of the boat. But I want you to put your mind into the headspace of that 19, 20, 23 year old soldier that's sitting on a rubber raft in the middle of the open ocean off the coast of Panama, thousands of miles from home. It's pitch black, it's dark, he or she, he's sick, he's hungry, he's miserable, he's wet, he's going to throw up, and he's scared. Can't see anything. All he can see is the person in front of him and the person to his left or his right. That person is rowing, so this soldier's going to row. 
Now, the person in front of him can't see anything either. He's sick, he's hungry, he's miserable, he's thirsty, he's wet, and he's scared. He can't see anything because of the person in front of him and the person who's left or right. They're rowing, so he keeps rowing. Remember, six hours. Six hours of rowing. The person in the very front is a non-commissioned officer. He's a junior leader. He's in the very front of the boat. He can't even see anybody else. All he can see is the open ocean and the fact that we're making no progress in this giant beast that we're floating around in. He's sick, he's hungry, he's wet, he's tired, he's thirsty, and he's scared. And he's worried about his soldiers that are behind him. But he can hear their oars hitting the water, so he keeps rowing. So let me ask you a question. I may be the formal leader of the boat, but who are the real leaders in the boat? Every single soldier in the boat. Because leadership is about influence. It's about what you do and how you affect those around you. I, at that point in time, am the least effectual leader in that boat. They will not keep rowing unless they all keep rowing. Understand they're all tired, they're all miserable, they're all wet, and they're all scared. But if I put my oar in the water, that encourages a person next to me and inspires them to keep putting their oar in the water. Or I can make a choice, take my war or out and take a break, break. But if that guy next to me is on his last leg and he's about to quit and you take your out of the, order, out of the water, then he's pulling his out of the water. But if you keep yours in and he looks at you, now he's thinking he can do it, I can do it. That's the key about leadership. It's all about influence and it's not determined by where you sit in the boat. You have an option every day to raise the water level or lower the water level, it all impacts those around you. So it goes back to the 12th rep. So some things I've learned to do over time. You don't have to be the best performer on the team. You just have to learn to give the 12th rep. As you give the 12th rep, everybody around you gets inspired to do the same thing, whether you're the best or not. We had one soldier on the boat that couldn't swim. Now they made fun of him, and they talked about he'd be the first one to get eaten if we went to the Chagras, but at the same time, not a single soldier would have allowed him to get in the boat. They all would have gotten out before him because they knew he was in there and doing his best. It's a point where it becomes your organization, your store, your mission. It's no longer somebody else's, it's mine. I own it. And when you own it, everything changes. That's when you can carry your share of the load. And we have a saying in the Ranger Battalion, one of the Ranger Creed stanzas, is that I will carry more than my share of the load, 100% and then some. The 100% and then some makes no sense individually, but it makes a lot of sense corporately. Because what it's saying is I'm gonna carry 100% of my load, and then I'm gonna turn around and carry whatever percentage I need to carry of your load. That's the beauty of ownership. It's not my particular lane. It's I'm looking around and I want this whole organization to be successful. The boat has to be successful. So I'm not just carrying my load, but I'm looking around to see who else's load I need to carry. And I'm having an impact everywhere I go. That's that 12th rep in everything that I do. That's really important to understand. You have a choice. When you start hitting all areas of your store and of your profession and anywhere you're at, and you start lifting more than your share and you find weaknesses and you help people out, what you find is it raises everybody's water level around you. Also, that means you gotta own your own failures. How many, how many of you have failed before? How many of you like admitting you failed? I know, I hate it. Isn't it terrible? You gotta own your failures. This is a life-changing thing, believe it or not. When you own your failures, you admit to them. What it does is it forces you now to accept that you failed, you gotta move past it, but it also helps you learn the lessons from that failure. When I push the failure off, when I blame somebody else, when I try to find an excuse for failure, then I learn nothing. But when I own the failure, even if it's not fully mine, then I learn and I get better from the failure. It's key. It is a life-changing event because when you own your failures, you actually improve through them.